Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Abby Seif and Tom Slay to our At Home with Literati series in support of their recent books, Troubling the Water and The King's Touch, respectively. Just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. Uh, the chat is closed, but you can keep that chat window open as I will be sharing links to purchase books from tonight's authors from Literati throughout the event. And the Q&A is accessible to you at any time. We encourage you to submit your questions. Whenever you have them, I'll read a selection at the conclusion of the conversation. And live transcription is available on your toolbar as well. If you're watching us later on our YouTube channel, you can always find links to purchase books in the description directly below me. While you're there, you can also like and subscribe to our channel to be kept up to date with all of our At Home With Literati events when they become available on our YouTube channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan, of course, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, however, we'd like to just thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, um, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us during, during the Q&A. But without further ado, I will get out of the way and I will introduce um, our authors this evening in reverse order of their reading. Tom Slay is the author of 11 books of poetry, most recently The King's Touch, as well as House of Fact, House of Ruin, Station Said, Army Cats, and Spacewalk, winner of the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. He's also the author of two essay collections, The Land Between Two Rivers, Writing in an Age of Refugees, which recounts his time as a journalist in the Middle East and Africa, an interview with a ghost. Slay is a distinguished professor in the MFA program at Hunter College and lives in New York. And Abby Seif is a journalist who was based in Southeast Asia for nearly a decade, working as an editor at the Cambodia Daily and Phnom Penh Post, and writing for publications such as Time, Economist, Al Jazeera, and Pacific Standard, among others. She's now a freelance correspondent. Please join me in welcoming Tom Slay and Abby Seif into your living rooms. Um, John, thank you so much. And thank you to Literati for having us. Um, and Tom, thank you for being here with me. This is an exciting experiment. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a bit from my book and then Tom will read from his book. Um, I'm going to read from the last chapter. So it's a bit of a spoiler. Um, it's not really it's history and journalism. Um, and it's called The Gourd Sinks, Broken Glass Floats. A patch of stunted shrubs, gnarled greenery peaks above the water. In the distance, there is a line of floating houses, robin egg walls topped with red rust roofs. Two boats stand here, tiny wood pirogues, bows angled toward one another. A fisher in a bucket hat, his skinny jeans soaked through, lists dangerously as he pulls on his half of the orange net. His striped partner mirrors him from the neighboring boat. The men twist the ends while they pull up the net, a fat hammock of palm-length fish writhing helplessly as water spills from their bodies and back into the lake. A beat later, the fishers have emptied their catch into their boats and moved on to the next doomed expanse. The lake is full of strange illusions. During the drought, the Tonle Sap is covered with a fine red algae that makes it look as if it's spilling, spilling into endless sand flats. The hillside Phnom Congray looms in the distance, slim blue humps against a flat belt of the tropical horizon. Snow crowns the peaks and the sun, which does its best to melt them without effect, gives them a pale ethereal look, a 19th century explorer insisted impossibly. From the sky, one type of fishing trap looks like a massive arrow, an unknown signal. Look out at the lake in one direction and it might be the ocean. Spin around and there are two boats parked against a bone dry tree. A man stands nearby, water cutting no higher than his thigh. From Siem Reap to Badenbong, a hard surface seems to run the length of the lake bed. In the middle, the remains of an old road had apparently been discovered, Adolf Bastian Road in 1864. For decades, word of an Encorian causeway bounced from fisherman to colonialist to researcher. Fantastic, improbable, but hunted ceaselessly. And why shouldn't the impossible be possible here? This is a place where land becomes water twice each year. Traveling up a small river leading into the Tonle Sap, 
I spot smudges on the sky. The boat draws forward and the smudges come undone. They're storks, a cacophony of slender legs and calligraphic wings, folding and unfolding upon one another as they range toward the land. We pass houses, stilted then floating, until the inlet spills into a placid sea. The sky is a cloudless crystalline blue, doubled by the water. The signs of man are like this. A fisherman in a lemon drop t-shirt walks slowly through the water as he spools out a floating net. A woman crouches in her boat, pulling at a trap, her companion standing in the lake, steadying. Here the water is just ankle high, where it laps at a sandbar covered in golden bush grass. Two fishers stand threading their net out, out, out. A fishing campsite floats over the lake. It is a tangle of stakes holding up a platform strong enough for four fishers in their hammocks, for coolers, pots, and dozens of traps. Tethered to it are two small boats with motors for daily catch and two big boats with half moons of tartar tarp for family living. Children wander from the platform to the boats. A TV antenna and a light bulb are lashed to the tallest stakes. In March 2017, one year after the wildfires, Prechtol is lush again. Upriver, we had boated past low sweeps of land, still covered only in the dull brown of dead foliage. But here, it is bright in every direction. Li Hang leads us behind his home, where a thick carpet of green has overtaken the dark ground. Pal leaves snake across the floor, their vines strangling humps of burned shrubs. The sky is overcast with the promise of a timely rainy season. The water depth is fairly normal. The catch has much approved. Still, the neighbors stopping by Hang's shop don't seem demonstrably better off. The fishermen don't have enough money, he says. They ask to play later all the time. A smart fisherman can make another business and do a bit better, but if they're not, it's just hand to mouth. Hang points out the changes at his own home. He has been installing solar panels, cheaper than the diesel needed to power his generator. Despite the slight improvement this year after the drought, the problems on the lake have passed the point of no return. I think in the next 20 years, there won't be much change, Hang predicts, but in 50 or 60 years, things will be very different here. It strikes me then as an optimistic timeline, but even I am taken aback by how fast everything unwinds over the next few years. Slowly and then very fast, the seasons stop working. In 2018, there's too much rain and too much water. In July, a dam collapses in Laos, sending its reservoir pouring across the countryside. Whole villages are swept away and scores are killed. The water rushes down across the Cambodian border. Thousands hurry to relocate as the river spills its blink, flooding 17 villages, destroying homes and crops. A year later, it's gone bone dry. A drought sweeps the region. In 2019, almost one year to the day after the dams collapse, the level of the Mekong dips to a record low. An entire dam reservoir in Thailand dries up, revealing the remains of a temple drowned decades earlier. In Laos, less than half the land can be planted on. The Mekong slows to a drip, and so there's no fresh water to push out the salt, spilling into Vietnam's delta, destroying crops by the ton. Once again, fishers say the same thing. We've never seen it like this. We have never experienced water level so low. Every year, it seems there's a new awful superlative to place on the lake. In 2016, excuse me, recovery mechanisms have failed completely. In 2017, the fishing came back after the drought year. Debts could be repaid, stocks replenished. In 2020, a fisher might spend an entire day pulling nets and coming up with this. A few eels, two snakes. The desperation is growing palpable. Set at the end of rainy season, the water festival is a glorious affair. Each November, as water begins flooding out again from the Tonle Sap, a million Cambodians pack into minivans and buses and head for the capital. This water festival, in some iteration or another, is perhaps 800 years old, but began as a commemoration of Jayavarman VII's crushing naval defeat of the Chams, morphed over time into a Thanksgiving of sorts, a celebration of the river's reversal, the fertile pulse. The nights are for partying, the days are for racing. Spectators throng the riverfront to watch long dragon boats manned by dozens. Two by two, the boats chase down the Tonle Sap River. By then, the water has become dangerous deep and swift. Branches and tangles of hyacinth, unmoored by the swelling river, rush alongside the paddlers. 
Most years, boats unturn, overturn. On occasion, racers drown. In 2009, I interviewed a number of captains. Their biggest concern to a man was the height of the water. They were fishermen. They knew how to swim, each assured me. But did I know how they might get life jackets? We want to race to keep our traditions alive. It makes us happy, a rower told me by way of explaining why he took the risk year after year. Just one decade later, as their oars ripped through the water for the 2019 Water Festival, racers find themselves speeding on a river that has reached a historic low. At the bottom of the concrete quay where the crowds gather, a patch of browning grass stretches out toward the shallow water. The tonle sap, lapping at its edges, barely appears to be moving. In 2020, the races are canceled because of COVID-19. Too dangerous to travel, to pack the riverfront, too much poverty streaming across the country. Then, too, the river never really reverses course. What could there be to celebrate? Thank you very much. Tom, would you like to read some of your beautiful poetry for us? That was wonderful, Abby. Thanks so much. Um, and I just want to thank um, uh, John and Literati Bookstore and um, particularly Abby uh, for doing this and uh, to everybody who's here tonight. Um, I, I thought what I'd do is just pick up in a way uh, where Abby left off, um, because one of the things that I've been writing about over the years is um, the um, refugee situation in um, both East Africa and in the Middle East. And so there are a lot of interesting uh, overlaps between what's going on in Cambodia now, and I think in a place, say, like Somalia, um, where the climate is rapidly changing and creating incredibly difficult uh, circumstances for anybody who happens to live there. Um, but the uh, first poem I'm gonna read, uh, has to do with a different kind of population. Uh, it's basically one of the things that people may or may not know um, because I've done so much journalism. Uh, I remember back in 2007 was the first time I ever did any of this uh, kind of thing. And uh, I was um, asked to write about uh, both Palestinian uh, refugees in Syria and in Lebanon. Um, and so, this poem is in two parts. Uh, it takes a hard uh, right turn in the middle uh, in the second part. And um, one thing that people may not know is that um, in 1948, when the Palestinians were expelled um, in the war, the, um, many of them took the deeds to their houses with them. The poem is called, In Which a Spider Weaves a Web on My Computer Screen. One, what is that shadow that weaves itself so fine across the edge of my computer screen? There it is, a pinprick of a spider weaving a web I'm looking through, as if it were a veil of second sight that, as I type these words behind the veil, the screen light shines right through. It weaves the sun into its web and turns the screen into a mirror, shooting back my own eyes, looking at the spider and wondering what the spider knows of me. Hello, pal, I want to say, but that feels unctuous, overly familiar for what I know I'm going to do. The web sways and ripples each time I breathe, getting ready to rip it away. There's a lot of casual brutality to reconcile. The spider clings to its web's outer rim, plucks with a slender leg a near invisible guy wire. Each time I type a word and the silk trembles. Okay, two, he said that being a refugee was like living like a spider 
in the bottom of a well. He held his quiet dignity close to him. The others in the room stopped talking. I won't repeat exactly what he said, since it's his to tell. But it had to do with how his mother died, how his home was destroyed. The words you use to talk about such things, the second they're uttered, sound suspect. For him to say, the soldiers shot my father, they blew up our house, and the worst thing I ever saw, the very worst, was seeing my baby brother crying on my dead mother's breast is only my rendering in English what the translator speaking in French said he said. Raveled in words, as a spider is raveled in its silk. I think I should know what to want to say, but to want to say is not what the man in his use of a figure of a spider drifting suspended, tethered to a lifeline spinning out impossibly fine, intends when he says, the deeds to my house are stained with blood, and then shows you the stains, three long stains, dried brown and fading above the signature line. This next poem is called Youth. Um, and again, it's the same kind of, um, you know, material that, uh, all three poems that I'm going to read tonight uh, come out of. And in this one, uh, you know, the speaker of the poems, a journalist who has been assigned to, you know, write about how uh, soldiers, um, you know, cope with the stress of battle, but he can't wrap his head around the assignment uh, because in the military compound where he's staying, there are two little boys who were down in the yard uh, who keep playing. And even when the mortar rounds, you know, come in daily around tea time. They just are so used to it, they keep on playing. Youth. Smelling of sweet rosin, the Aleppo pines shadows grow taller by the hour. Two identical twin boys chase each other through the shadows. The one who's 10 minutes older yelling, I'm going to kill you, while the younger one laughs. Kill me. Kill me if you can. Day by day, these tea time mortars keep pecking at the blast wall. But the boys have grown so used to it, they keep on playing. If they weren't here in front of me, I'd find them hard to imagine, just as I sometimes find my own twin brother hard to imagine. I'm supposed to be doing a story on soldiers, what they do to keep from being frightened. But all I can think about is how Tim would chase me or I'd chase him and we'd yell, I'm gonna kill you just like these brothers do, so alive in their bodies, just as Tim who was so alive will one day not be. Will it be me or him who first dies? But I came here to do a story on soldiers and how they keep watching out for death and manage to fight and die without going crazy. The boys squat down to look at ants climbing through corrugated bark the wavering antennae tapping up and down the tree, reminding me of the soldier across the barracks, sitting still inside himself, listening to his nerves while his eyes peer out at something I can't see. When Achilles' immortal mother came to her grieving son, knowing he would soon die, 
and gave him his armor and kept the worms from the wounds of his dead friend Patroclus. She, a goddess, knew she wouldn't be allowed to keep those same worms from her son's body. I know I'm not his father. He's not my son. But he looks so young, young enough to be my son. Sitting on his bunk, watching out for death, trying to fight and die without going crazy. He reaches for his rifle, breaks it down, dust cover, spring, bolt carrier with piston, wiping it all down with a rag and oil, cleaning it for the second time this hour, while shadows shifting through the pines bury him and the little boys and Tim and me, as I'm supposed to be doing a story in non-metaphorical, real-life darkness. And then the last poem I'll read, um, I was in Libya uh, just a year or so after uh, Gaddafi had been deposed, and I was traveling with a militia. And, you know, when you say the word militia, it has a certain kind of connotation in this country. But in Libya, um, really, the head of my militia was um, an electrical engineer, um, just like my father, and had the same kind of, you know, mild manner <laughs> as my father. And it, the, the reason why, you know, everybody in the society who opposed Gaddafi, um, most of them obviously weren't soldiers, and they just had to learn how to use weapons on the fly when the rebellion began, very much like the situation in Ukraine right now. Um, and at a certain point, uh, as you know, we were having this really very nerdy conversation. Um, he uh, talking about you know load shedding and you know electrical capacity, etc. He showed me a video of uh, Gaddafi really during his last moments. Um, anyway, one of the names of Gaddafi was Murshid, which means the guide. A dictator walks into a bar. In the hotel lobby, leaning against the marble column from when the Romans ruled, I sip my vodka as gunfire night and day ricochets in celebration, punctuating someone's wedding or a moment in someone's mood in which blowing off a clip into the air fights off boredom. And the cell phone video, the more slashes of light jiggle and jag than a stable point of view. I watch them drag him from muck out of a culvert, his kufi knocked askew, heavy body thrown across a Toyota battle wagon where an electrical engineer turned militia man. It reminds me of my father, mild, unshowy, studiously polite, doesn't smile, frown, as he watches himself slapping in the footage that he's showing me. The great leader, the great Murshid, the guide, doesn't comment, doesn't shy away from my oh-so-fine-tuned sensitivities, quivering on the brink, maybe a little drunk, my cloak of objectivity already tattering into rags. His lumps, welts, not quite bleeding. Unable to look away, am I hoping to see blood? It isn't every day that a dictator rise under your heel. The one powerful enough to say, those who do not love me, do not deserve to live. 
as if he himself were the soul and the body politic. And we were just an afterthought, accessory to his glory, the merest janitors to his trash, or maybe just the trash itself, all of us human trash waiting to be burned. But now it's our turn, and we've got him where we want him. His livid, puffy face, its blankness unto death, like slopped over paint running down the can. His nose by now smashed in, so his mouth hangs open to the blawness of desert hardpan and cliffs shadowing tank tracks back into the Nafusa Mountains. Or just an hour ago, we were driving and he was worrying about load shedding and high voltage grids, the tragedy of no infrastructure. While I was daydreaming of vodka and peeling happy hour shrimp, glinting like armor plate. Finally, I've seen enough. But as I turn to give him back his phone, he's moved down the bar and seems head bowed to be peering into his drink with that intimate anticipation that could signal a joke or a prayer speeding to its punchline. Only it's the new kind of humor, the new kind of prayer in which the jokes aren't funny and prayers don't deliver. And whether you're praying or laughing, it's all on you. Thanks very much. Tom, thank you for reading those. Um, a Dictator Walks Into a Bar is my new favorite poem, so I'm, I'm particularly glad you read that one. Um, you know, I, I'm really struck in all these poems, you seem to have these layers of inter, interlocutors, as it were, which I think really kind of reflects what it's sometimes like to be a, a journalist overseas when you're translating or you're, you know, writing a about a soldier who's involved in a war that's ultimately affecting, you know, these people on the ground who are just these distant children that you have no connection with. Um, but what I was very struck by was that um, my cloak of objectivity already tattering into rags. Um, and I was, you know, what when you go when you go when you are reporting or you know, do, what what is your kind of role? Where do you see yourself fitting into this? bigger landscape. Yeah, well, um, you know, when we talked earlier, Abby, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a real journalist, I'm an amateur because I haven't made my living at it the way you do. And, and I like, you know, I, I write these long form essays really. And it takes me, you know, sometimes several years, you know, to write about a particular region. And, and I guess the first thing I could say about it is that that the um, uh, when I first started to do this, and I'm very curious to know how you came to, you know, figure out what it was you were supposed to do. <laughs> um, you know, I I, I, I was in Lebanon, and uh, you know, this kind of mini civil war broke out. This was back in 2007, like I was saying, and. Um, I was traveling with another journalist, a guy named Christopher Merrill, who really knew what he was doing. And I had a notebook and I was supposed to write an article, um, but you know, I didn't really have anything to write about uh, because I've been a poet my whole writing life and I'd never ever experienced um, anything you know, remotely like the kind of uh, violence that was going on. And so I asked, you know, after several days of feeling kind of ridiculous, <laughs> I got a pen, I got a notebook, what do I do with them? I just asked my friend, Chris, and, and the first thing he said, he said, well, first of all, Tom, you take notes about everything. And the one thing you don't take notes about are your feelings. <laughs> no one cares about your feelings. And that was a wonderfully liberating thing. Um, and so in a, in a way to briefly come at your um, answer, I think what happened, what happens for me when I'm in these situations 
is that I totally forget about what I'm feeling in any particular moment. There's really no time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The logistics that you're dealing with are so complicated. You, you have a job to do and it's, and part of your job is, you know, not to get bogged down and feeling this and feeling that, you know, you feel it later, you know, but you don't, but at the moment, I'm just so involved in trying to record as carefully as I can, you know, having the situation imprint as deeply as it can on my nervous system so that I have de the details the texture of the experience, because as an outsider, you know, I don't have the intimate knowledge, the historical background, and often given the kinds of work that I do, um, you know, I'm, I'm either in a war zone or in a place where it's having, where there will be a war, has been a war, and, and always in these situations, at least certainly in East Africa, and in, and, and in the Middle East to a certain extent, in Libya, say, it's an intimate history of killing. And I don't know what that history is. And so rather than pretend that I do, um, I try to build into the piece my limitations and I don't shy away from that. And so in that line that, you know, uh, you hit on my cloak of objectivity, you know, I, I often find that when I'm interviewing somebody or talking to somebody or just trying to take in exactly, you know, the details of a situation, that that is the most effective way that I can present what I know. And that is something that I noticed in your work is that it is beautifully textured. The whole last passage that you read, um, it's, it's, it, it has a certain kind of uh, wonderfully, you know, naturalistic, accurate descriptive quality to it, but it's also imbued with a certain kind of emotionality in which you don't have to say anything about how you feel about it because the texture of the language already projects that. And in a way that, you know, you don't have to worry about, I don't know, overt moralizing, which is one of the things I, I least like in any yeah. work. <laughs> so I'd just be curious to know what you how you, how you respond to that. No, I, I think that's a great way. And I really like that you put um, sort of an emphasis on the, the limits of, what, what did you write down? Like acknowledging your own limitations because um, you're obviously doing a really different type of journalism here that um, perhaps allows for that more. But, you know, I, I think um, many of us, uh, kind of get into trouble when we when we don't do that you know this idea that this journalist is the the be all end all with knowledge or that um or that your objectivity you know can't can't come in there you're we're sort of i think in american journalists in particular this is something that has become a, a bigger conversation in the trump era because you know how how what does it mean to be objective in the face of fascism say um and so yeah, I mean, this obviously the the book I wrote is a bit different. Um, you know, for me, I was I had certain limitations, which were uh, very logistical limitations, which were wow. um, I was working off a, a body of reporting that was a few years old. I thought I would be able to go back to Cambodia, um, and it wasn't because of COVID, um, and so that ended up kind of narrowing the scope. And I I was really um, I was really, you know, scraping the marrow with with these <laughs> four year old notebooks, and I'm I'm curious to know if because I know you sometimes write about things you've seen a decade ago, um, and I said, what what can I do to to make this richer and to make this um, feel more? Um, and for me, fortunately, uh, it's not down to my notes; it's down to photographs. Um, so I had a I was traveling with a fantastic photographer, Nick Axelrod. Um, and I also had a lot of my own photos and little videos. I wonder if you do this when you, you know, iPhones make it very easy and you can always, whenever I go around, cause I have a terrible memory. I, I try to, you know, when I'm on reporting trips I try to make little videos and, and I spend a lot of time using those 
to describe what I see, but also to jog my memory. Um, mm -hmm. And I found that to be a helpful tool. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you would think that's cheating because it's, it's oh, no, not a, a very good note taker. <laughs> I mean, no, no, not. I mean, I don't have any views on the matter. I mean, I, you know, my, my, my way of doing it is, um, you see, the thing I, I really love, though, about what you do, you know, there are a lot of people who take photographs and jog their memories with video, but then it sounds like somebody's describing a photograph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the thing that's interesting about what you're doing is you're actually engaging with the memory and you're transforming the photograph. So that it really does have this kind of very powerful subjective feeling and spontaneous feeling. You know, like the perceptions are spontaneous in the moment. It doesn't matter what the verb tense is. Sure. It's, it's the intensity of the perception that is really so beautiful in the work. And, and that's one of the things that, that I, you know, um, as soon as I started reading the book, I thought, oh, I'm going to like this. Well, because, I, because I, mean, <laughs> I, you know, there's not somebody who's going to be, you know, boring the pants off me with I'm glad to hear. <laughs> how I'm supposed to feel about this, that, and the other thing, you know, there's not going to be this kind of stern moralizing figure mm -hmm. at the center. <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, it's more, more by kind of juxtaposing this situation against this situation, against this situation, against this situation that I find in any way that I can make a much more comprehensive statement, you know, without having you know, to commit myself to, you know, the banalities of punditry. Well, I'm, I'm really curious when you go on these, when you go on these trips, mm -hmm. um, let's, let's say you've taken a trip with the aim of writing a long form essay. Yeah. At, what, at what point are you, are you thinking, I want to peel this off into a, a poem? Are you doing that while you're going around? Is that coming never, much no, later? No, never. No, when I'm when I'm on a trip, I don't have any thoughts other than getting the details down, mm -hmm. and and I don't I, I don't I typically have not used photographs. Uh, I have an extremely good memory for visual information. It's probably because you know when I was a kid, my mother and father ran a drive-in movie theater, mm. and, and every night I went to the movies because we didn't have money for babysitting, and so my you know my bedtime story was huge faces on a screen and I know that I'm, that really um, kind of informed my whole I don't know my visual sense and I also have a really really good uh, memory for um, speech mm -hmm. you know um, I, and also because I've, I've, I so I I don't use that but I I, I you know immensely admire um, people who it doesn't matter to me how you do it it's just the fact is <laughs> you know i mean i thought wow abby has the best goddamned you know visual memory and, it's, and you know but it but it is a different thing you know mm -hmm. i can tell when somebody's describing a photograph and yeah. when somebody is actually you know giving me the texture of a moment such that the language itself is embodying it as opposed to like mm -hmm. you know commenting on it or kind of gesturing at it you know? well you have to you know you have to experience these things first person yeah. you have to see it it's yeah. not enough to you know stand on your yeah. balcony in the capitol and, <laughs> right. and i'm sure i wonder if you you know like you said you had these journalists kind of leading you around or, or giving you a hand you know yeah again like what um I don't know. I'm curious. I'm curious how you got into this in the first place, in fact. Well, well, it was simple. I mean, you know, I just got asked uh, by um, by this really this mom and pop, you know, uh, organization called Transculture Arab Unity Foundation, which sounds like a really big deal. But it was just this guy and his wife, mm -hmm. you know, a Syrian uh, translator of uh, Mahmoud Darwish. And his wife, uh, Amir al Sain, who's a Lebanese poet, and they decided that they wanted to take you know, some American writers, poets, uh, over to Lebanon and Syria to meet Palestinians face to face. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not 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 in the usual, you know, handler, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. situation. And and when we got there, you know, the civil this kind of mini civil war broke out. And so I 
I'd already been asked to write about it, you know, and when I was going over there, honestly, Abby, I'm, I was thinking what I'm going to write about my summer vacation in Lebanon. I mean, you know, I had no idea what I was supposed to do, but, but the ferocity of what happened there, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, the fact that people uh, were dying, the fact, and it was so different than say what happens in the United States when a bomb goes off. Um, for example, one of the things that happened just after I got there, there was a huge explosion down in a, in a part of Lebanon called Ashrafia, which is a very kind of fashionable shopping district. And, and I was taking notes on everything. I mean, literally everything. I would see something on the television and I, I didn't think, well, but like, for example, a TV ad in Lebanon, which I watched, was of a guy in a leather jacket, you know, very Tony in a, like um, uh, a uh, Mercedes. Mm -hmm. And he has what looks like, you know, a TV wand in his hand. Mm -hmm. And he presses, you know, the TV wand and it senses, you know, Simtex, classic explosive <laughs> under his car. And then the logo comes on, you know, Prosec for a world of security. <laughs> wow. And it's, but it's that kind of odd, mm -hmm. weirdly humorous, obviously absurd detail mm -hmm. that just imprints itself on me. And, and oh, there's your cat. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but it's, it's, you know, it's that kind of thing that imprints itself on, on my mind deeply. And so, and just in terms of the shopping, mm -hmm. so this, this shopping district. So there was a big car bomb and this car was just blackened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I went down there to look at it and there was just like one piece of caution tape. In the United States, it would have been blocked off for miles and miles and miles. But, you know, you have to remember these folks went through a 15 year civil war. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're not blasé, but when you know I would act all hyped up about a bombing, I would say, "Oh my God, what about the bombing?" And everybody, you know, from a former former prime minister, all the way down to you know, you know, taxi drivers, and everybody would say, "Ah, welcome to Lebanon." Yeah. <laughs> you know, and anyway, the point I'm trying to make about this is is that the I learned a lot about blast waves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a blast wave had knocked out the show window of what turned out to be an Armani store. Mm -hmm. And because the blast wave had, you know, exploded the glass, it created this vacuum inside the store and sucked all the clothes mm -hmm. into the street. And suddenly you're looking at like really expensive, you know, suits and jackets. And you're thinking, wow, that's my size a 44 long, a few scorch marks, you know. But those are the kinds of things that go through my head. Yeah. You know? and, and those end up in the article because I think because I, it, because there's there's a certain kind of persona, you know, that, is, as, that I associate with this kind of writing. Mm -hmm. And it often is kind of, you know, grim and doer. And what's happening is uh, terrible. But I've always found that the absurd and the tragic are, you know, cheek to cheek. Yeah, and yeah. it strikes me you really, you can only do that as an outsider with very fresh eyes. Anyone who had been there for more than a few minutes wouldn't even, yeah. you know, there wouldn't even be a bit of color in their story because it's so... Yeah. Uh, can, can I ask you a question? Sure, sure yeah. I, I would really love to know what the backstory is for how you spend so much time in, in Cambodia and, mm -hmm. you know, Southeast Asia in general. Yeah, um, so I... Graduated from college, moved back. I'm from New York. I moved back here and I was working at a magazine. Um, and I had always wanted to live abroad in a very nebulous <laughs> think about where or why, or um, I just had that idea. Um, and over the years, I had kept, you know, almost moving to France, almost moving to Argentina, and, you know, a job would keep me. Um, and finally, I had I'd been working at this magazine for all of two and a half years. And I thought, well, if I if I stay any longer, I'll stay here for my whole life. And, you know, what? Uh, I was very young. Um, and so I was I needed to get out. And I found I found a job ad for a newspaper in Cambodia, which was called the Cambodia Daily. You know, it's a English language 
daily newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, and I applied and I had never been to Asia and, you know, my knowledge of Cambodia was pretty woefully non-existent at that point. Um, mm -hmm. And the newspaper, um, they barely had a website. They, you know, it was this broadsheet. It was hard to, it was a little like, is this a real thing? Um, but it was a phenomenal newspaper and a lot of, a lot of correspondents and a lot of DC journalists had gotten their start there because it was run by this absolutely wild and mercurial American journalist who used to work for Newsweek in the 60s mm -hmm. and in the 90s decided to start this paper. Um, it was kind of like a joint training ground for young American journalists and young Cambodian journalists. Um, and so we'd work side by side in teams um, and we'd also, uh, you know, work on the English language, the edit the notes from the Cambodian reporters. And, um, and it was, an, I mean, it was very tough. I'm not gonna, I could talk about it for too long, but it was an amazing job because you, you're at a very young age, you're covering serious things. You know, this is a national newspaper and yeah. there's criminal cases and war crimes tribunals and mm. serious government corruption. And that's your job. Um, and so it, you know, there were tons of us who worked there. It became, it's very hard to kind of leave that once you get into it. Um, and I, I stayed working at those papers for a few years and then I, I went freelance working sort of as a freelancer for different publications. And, um, and during that time I started reporting on this, not thinking it was for a book, just as magazine articles. Um, and then I came back to New York and the pandemic happened and I just go write a book, right? <laughs> Right. Well, good. Yeah. You, I mean, you wrote this. You wrote this during the last few years, right? I, I did. Yeah, probably the last four years, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, can I? So, how did the tonally sap? How did that become an obsession, such that you wrote a book about it? Then. Yeah, that was also a bit of kismet. I had a colleague, uh, this photographer, who who there was a very bad drought year, and there had been a bunch of wildfires at the lake, and so. Um, he wanted to see what the situation was. We went there for about a week and, um, you know, there were, what, what we sort of realized, and we, it's not that this hadn't been reported, but, you know, it wasn't just that it was a bad drought year and that there were fires, mm -hmm. um, but that fish had been steadily declining because of hydropower, um, because of climate change and because of overfishing. Uh, and I was very curious about that and, you know, started to go back again to learn more and see how they were doing a year later and then some time after that um, and then you know part of my book is a lot of these historical accounts and when you start looking at those they're just they're so striking because people are describing how abundant this fishery is and they're just breathless in these descriptions yeah 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 I mean one of the things I was thinking as I was reading your book is that you know because so many of the people uh, were being basically, they were moving to the city, they were having to find other ways of making a living. I mean, they were basically becoming, you know, a kind of unofficially right. displaced people. Refugees, which I know you write about. Yeah. And, 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 and one of the things that I, I was thinking about as I was reading your book was that it seemed like this situation as it progresses in 10 years, mm -hmm. when climate change really does take hold, you know, could end up in, in like certain situations that I've seen, like for example, in Somalia, sure. um, you, know, you know, I was there during a famine um, and you know, everybody reported it as if it were like this anomaly, but in fact, yeah. there have been five famines. <laughs> no, and I wish that was something that, uh, I mean, there's lots of journalists that talk about this, but when we talk about migrant crises, they are climate crises. And anytime we talk about somebody who's an economic migrant, which I find it, to be a disgusting term, um, you know, generally those are people leaving for opportunities because their farmlands are no longer tenable. Um, that's, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, and I think you and I were talking about Ukraine and, you know, there's oh, gonna yeah. be a huge famine in 18 months in, in the MENA region. Those are gonna be people who are leaving because they don't have access to enough food in yeah. part because yeah. of climate and what sort of welcome can they be expected to have? Yeah. I mean, one thing also that I was so struck too about, you know, uh, not every, not every 
person that you wrote about, but lots of the people were, they were just, they're on a razor thin edge yeah. between starvation and, you know, and, and just barely making it. And that was certainly something, you know, that I, that I saw in Somalia again and again. Mm -hmm. And, and, that, and it was also, you know, that there's all this, there's all this superstructure of government in, you know, intervention and government, um, you know, geopolitical foes, you know, uh, making a situation infinitely worse. But the people, you know, who are suffering, um, in, in my particular, you know, observations, I mean, they had no infrastructure. There was nothing to protect them from the worst effects of what was going to happen to them in terms of climate change. Yeah, it's very brutal to see. I mean, we it's extremely talk brutal. about this all the time, you know, that the, the most vulnerable people, and we obviously are starting to see it ourselves firsthand, but for most people, they've been suffering the impacts and, and kind of mitigating against it in their own ways, which is almost always migration. Um, it just yeah. strikes me that we are, should we, Go to the Q and A because I do see some people. Oh, have yeah, questions really have gone me. away. Um, I'm really enjoying talking to you, but I, yeah, I don't sure, want let's to go to the Q and A. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm I tempted totally to lost just track of time. Now. I'm tempted to let you keep going simply because you have quite, I guess, not unexpectedly answered or anticipated a lot of the questions oh, that have been asked. <laughs> Um, so well, I think we have time in our hour for, for one more though. Um, and so forgive me if I, if I didn't get to your question, I, I, I believe Tom and Abby touched on many of the questions you asked, and I thank you all for, for submitting your questions. Um, but, uh, I'll go to a question from Laura who asks, um, um, where do the two genres, poetry, uh, journalism, or is journalistic historical writing, I suppose, docu poetry, where do you see uh, the two genres meet for each of you? Abby, why don't you? Um, I mean, for me, I, I think ta this will be more interesting to have Tom answer it. For me, um, I, I, th I've written very much a journalistic book, so it's, you know, reportage, and then I've gone and done a little, let's say, archival research to bring in some, some more voices. But it's not. Um, I'm not jumping genre the way Tom is. So I, I'm glad somebody asked this because I really Abby, I thought you said you're writing fiction. I'd be curious to know. Oh, about... uh, I yeah, I am writing a bit of fiction. I am writing fiction now. I'm, I'm in an MFA program. Um, in that, um, I do a bit. I, I, um, I sort of. I have a piece, for instance, where I've used court transcripts as quotes um, for a character, um, and that, that's fun. You know, it's 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 fun the way you can kind of play with. I'm sure you you find this with your poetry, just make things fit a little bit in a way that they don't in real life. Yeah, yeah. And Ebby, I I sorry, just to just I, I to this question though, I I was struck by it in your reading. You know how much of your work um, is focused on uh, inscribing experience, you know, in this way, and and you do it in this way that uh, it comes across very clearly in your reading that there's there's I don't know I think so much of the work of poetry is is trying to reach this sort of ineffable uh, area, and obviously there's sort of like a more uh kind of straightforward teleology to like journalistic writing which is just sort of report things like to just sort of share some part of reality with the world but i guess i don't want to don't want to try to be too esoteric but i I'm, I'm curious about how craft comes into it for you essentially like there's clearly there is there is there is a sort of an evocativeness to, to the way you write that you're receiving as you're listening to it the the experiences of these uh of, of people talking about what what how what happened in the lake has incredibly terrible downstream effects on their livelihood but at the same time the way in which you are writing it or composing it also makes me think beyond that in a way that reminds me of what's happening with poetry where maybe i'm receiving the direct effect of an experience but the experience is making me think 
something beyond that. So I wonder for you, if there's something that's beyond what you are reporting out, there is this extra layer of making sure that something else is received through the process of writing, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I mean, I wanted the lake to be a character in this book. Um, it's not a typical narrative because I'm not following a single family or anything like that. But I, um, I really wanted somebody to feel like they could see and smell and, and, and feel this like, um, and so I spent a lot of time on those descriptions because I wanted, I wanted it to be experiential in some way. Thank you. Um, and Tom, um, obviously same question as you, but, but someone asked a, a question that may sort of dig a bit deeper into the question, which is um, uh, a lot of your work is about refugees and people in desperate situations. Some are more personal. How does that work in terms of your practice? How do you choose which to focus on? when you mean uh po poems or prose yeah well um well it's kind of a sh pretty shallow answer <laughs> but somebody asked me right <laughs> you know um, i go someplace and i have somebody says i i'd like you to write this for me and so i say okay how many words do i get and Generally, I, I write. I, I I really am not interested in writing for uh, places which you know want a quick in and out. I I, I just have no interest in that. And so, uh, when, when I'm, I tell you what happens uh, to me is that when I'm over there, I'm just taking notes. And then, like for example, I was in Iraq at a particularly um, bloody time, just when uh, ISIS was coming down and establishing itself uh, in the north northern part of Iraq. And um, the um, and the number of people who are being killed in different kinds of violence every day, you could follow on uh, on a website which is just run by a guy called Iraqi Body Count, and it would have uh, you know the details of each person's death and and, and that kind of thing, and. Um, one of the things that happened is because, uh, you know, I was doing a certain, uh, anyway, I was asked to meet with some students. Okay. Uh, that was part of the gig. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, because uh, it was too dangerous to be there on your own, unless, you know, you, you're a stronger sort than me. And so, you know, I was traveling around with uh, uh, contractors, uh, security contractors. And, 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 you know, they wanted me to sort of talk about how people write poems and in addition to, you know, journalism. And so one of the things I did was, well, I said, well, rather than, you know, just talk about it, why don't, why don't we all try to write a poem? And so I set up this really, really simple writing exercise. And I just said, here's what I want you to do. I, I, I want you to, you know, think back to your childhood and think back to your bedroom or your, you know, whatever room you happen to sleep in and, and maybe a favorite toy or something like that. And, and I want you to write, I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember for each of these memories. And then, and then at a certain point I said, and what I'd like you to do now is I would like you to write, I don't want to remember. And it was amazing what happened uh, because, you know, this was a generation of people who had grown up knowing nothing but war from the time they were born until they were in their 20s. You know, first it was war with Iran, uh, then it was, you know, the Gulf War, then it was the occupation. And, and in every case almost, and this, there must have been 20, 30, 40, people there, all of them either directly or obliquely wrote about the experience of war. And there was one particular young woman who wrote what I think is really one of the most amazing, and, and, and this isn't about literary judgment now. <laughs> you know, this isn't about that. This has nothing to do with that. Uh, but she wrote an amazing piece in which she described her brother coming in to talk to her in the morning and ask her if she needed anything at the market. 
And then she was too sleepy to know, really. I mean, she was half asleep. And she said, no, no. And then her brother said something like, well, this will be the last time you'll be seeing me. And so she woke up, she went to breakfast, and then she said a neighbor came in the house, you know, to their door about two hours, an hour and a half later, and said, well, there's been a car accident. Now, everybody in the room, except me, immediately knew that the brother had been a suicide bomber. And then it suddenly dawned on me that, oh yeah, that's what happened. And the fact that, you know, in, in our heads, we have suicide bombers as one kind of category. Right. And then the fact that he can also be an extraordinarily gentle brother. Those two things just really made a kind of amazing tension for me. And, and I guess one of the things that I can say about writing poems is that I don't, everybody has political convictions, right? I write, you know, I, but I find if I try to write out on my political convictions, I write incredibly boringly. <laughs> I don't discover interesting language, you know? Um, you know, there it, it's hopeless, but when you write out of what I, you know, what I, what I, you know, think of as something as 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 when a political conviction collides with a real life situation, and then that political conviction gets tested by it, and the kind of emotional response that I had to you know this young woman's story. So that what I was really experiencing was a much more complicated emotional thing, a political emotion as opposed to a political conviction. That's the place that I like to write poems out of. That's the place where I find that the language comes alive because I have to discover a language that will at least be adequate to all of these completely unexpected emotions in which I feel great conflict. And rather than trying to resolve that, to answer it, to neaten it up, to try to find the language to embody it, that's when poems become really interesting. And, and, and that's, it's quite a different task to do that for me than it is to write a long piece because there's all kinds of other, you know, um, uh, things that I need to do. I, I need to have some backstory. I need to have a certain feel for narrative. I need to, you know, stick to the facts. I need this, that, and the other thing. And so those are really, but, but, with, but with the poems, I can sort of focus in on the emotion and the con conflictual nature of the emotion. And then, you know, there's a beautiful statement uh, about, you know, poems, the poems follow the calendar of feeling as opposed to the calendar of events. And, and that's an interesting sort of distinction. So that, that's, that's how I would answer that. That's fantastic, Tom. That's very inspirational. <laughs> yeah, I think that's <laughs> a, a beautiful... I differently about how I'm writing. Well, I, I don't think you need my inspiration. You're <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, a truly beautiful place to, to to wrap up. I could truly let you go on for another hour. Uh, I know everyone. No, I know everyone here would would I'm too. Sorry, uh, went to dinner, John. Well, that's that's yes. I do not. I also it is my midwestern duty. <laughs> speaking of something we were talking about before we came on, to not let people be late for dinner. So um, I think we must say goodbye now. But um, Tom Slay, Abby Seif, thank you so much for joining us tonight at Home with Literati. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. I hope we can have you both in the store um, for your next works. But uh, please do buy Troubling the Water and The King's Touch. There are links in the chat and links in the description below if you're watching us on late, later on YouTube. Uh, Tom, Abby, hope you continue to uh, be well. And to all of our viewers, we thank you for joining you, for joining us. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great night and a great weekend, everybody. Take care.
Good night. Thanks, Thank John. You. Thanks, Abby. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, audience. Thank you, John.